Hi folks, welcome to another episode of NYC CNC. This is part four of my series on making copper jackets for bullets. In part three, we finished making the top piece here. We've got our two dowel pins, and we've got two 832 socket head cap screws that we're gonna to use to secure these pieces together. And then we're gonna turn the center diameter as well as the outside diameter all in one pass to ensure concentricity. We've got our larger piece in the vise here. We've got a same diameter piece on the other side just to keep it uh, the vise secure. And we made this piece a little bit longer and that'll give us some room to hold this in the jaws so that we can turn the full length of the OD when it's on the lathe. We'll get to that down the road here in a minute. Uh, before we hop into this part though, I wanted to go over to the CAD model and computer to talk about a few quick things. All right, the first thing is in the previous video, I talked about the question of how to handle the copper jacket once it's formed. Would it be stuck on the purple punch or would it be stuck inside the yellow die here? And the answer to me, and full credit out to a fellow Dave over on the Cast Bullets forum, mentioned that in, in he has a design that's very similar to this, is the solution is you make the yellow punch or die, it's forms a, it performs both roles here, uh, hollow such that as you continue to form cups out of blanks by repeatedly doing this motion, the cups will just stack up in the yellow tube and eventually pop out the top. Uh, that should work. The thing I'm already thinking about is do you turn a larger ID or a taper in here so that once the blanks hit you know, halfway up or something, they are now loose inside this and you could pull them out, or perhaps if you even had enough room to cut a little window in here and have them fall out. That would be pretty cool. I'll worry about that later, but the important thing is that's a that's an important change. So uh, this is the design I'm sticking with for now, but I will obviously keep you guys updated uh, on how that changes. For those of you who are new to NYC CNC, I like to be just really honest about uh, about my you know lessons and, and what I'm able to do and where I make mistakes or goof. That's kind of part of the process. Man, I'm embarrassed about this one. A uh, big shout out to the fellow Ron. He called me out on what would have been a big mistake. I have a .95 inch blank that weighs 50 grains. If I want half that weight, you don't just reduce the diameter of the disc by half, you reduce the surface area. Here's a little chart I made, which is if we have a .95 inch diameter or .475 radius part and it weighs 50 grains, that's irrelevant for the surface area, but the surface area, which is just simply radius uh, squared times pi, or pi r squared, is 0.704. So we want half that surface area since the thickness of the part isn't changing. So that's 0.354, and that means we want to a diameter of 0.671. I will say that when I concluded a half inch diameter, I thought to myself, that's odd that if you're going from 0.5 inches only down to point 355 for a nine millimeter. It kind of didn't pass the smell test, but I didn't, uh, I won't, you know, I won't fib. I didn't think enough to, to really think through it. So again, big shout out, big thanks to Ron for calling me out on that. Okay, let's hop back over now. We're gonna cut the uh, four holes in the bottom piece here. And as I mentioned, we've, uh, we're only designing this to be an inch and a half long. We've cut it about three inches long. That'll give us some room to hold that in the lathe jaws. What we're going to then do is, is use the alignment dowel pins and the screws to fasten this part together as one and turn the outside and a outside diameter and then turn an inside hole. That way we've got two different turn surfaces that we know are concentric that we can use to as reference points uh, on our future cutting ops here. I used a quarter inch end mill off camera and just leveled off the top of that part. We've got it zeroed. Let's go ahead and drill our four holes. Okay, four holes are drilled. Now we're gonna go over to the drill press and we're gonna tap the large two holes, 832, and then we're gonna ream these out to 
a thou over 125 for a nice slip fit with our dowel pins. For tapping, if I have a, the, the fastener handy, I always like to do a quick sanity check on the thread pitch, make sure I've got the right one. And then we're going to chuck our tap in the drill press and add a little cutting fluid. And I like to use a heavy but free floating vise. And the reason I like it to be heavy is I'm going to just rotate the drill chuck by hand. And if you don't have a heavy vise, it'll actually pick the part up instead of uh, instead of pulling the uh, chuck into it. I like this because it gives me a good feel for the part. It's a little tricky right now because of the camera placement. That gets it started here and then we'll switch over to the uh, hand tool. I always like to buy American made high quality taps, especially these small ones because once you have one break off in an expensive or a project or a part or something you've got a lot of time into, man, it's not fun uh, spending the time to get one out or taking it over and having it EDM'd out. It's interesting, tapping this 1144, you can feel, uh, unlike aluminum and unlike even uh, a lot of steels I've worked with before, it doesn't uh, build up a chip like you would think. It, uh, I mean, normally on an 832 tap, I'd have more resistance and feel of a buildup in between the flutes. So this stuff does seem to machine pretty nicely. Okay, just a tiniest ever amount of a burr. Probably run a hand file over that too here. Okay, now let's ream uh, our two holes out to 126. I always put my reamers right back in their case. That way they don't get dinged up or, or lost. Okay, now let's go grab uh, a, an extra dowel pin and see how it fits. I like to do this before I put the real part in. Oh, that's perfect. Just in case the part is tight, that could be the alignment of the two and not the pinhole itself. Let's, okay, let's grab the part we made. And there we go. That's perfect. Here's the part. I threaded the top together and you can see through the slot there where a copper strip will go. Feels great. We're actually going to throw it on the lathe here in a second and see what the run out difference is. I'm excited to see what that looks like. I wanted to mention though, I've been looking for a way to communicate more with you guys and, and post up pictures and updates and all that and it occurred to me that a Facebook page might be a good idea. So I've created one for NYC CNC. I'm going to throw up a lot more impromptu stuff, pictures behind the scenes, etc. So if you're on Facebook and you're interested in seeing a little bit more about the shop and maybe some behind the scenes type stuff, hop on over and like the page. Okay, I'm going to put this in the vise just so it'll hold steady. We're going to see how our copper strip fits through.
Perfect. S slides through with no problem, but uh, isn't doesn't have too much play up or down or side to side. So I think that's going to be good. Let's get this on the lathe and see what the run out looks like. Okay, I put the part in the forejaw. What we're going to do is bring the indicator over and center up our jaw on the first, the larger bottom piece here, and then we're going to see what the difference is on the top piece. Okay, not too bad to run out for just having thrown it in without uh, knowing where the jaws were. So I always, what I do is I always make sure all my jaws are pretty tight to start with. And then, see here, that's the, that's the low point, and that's the, that's the high point. So what we do is we find the low point and we loosen. See if I can do it in a way here that you can still see the test indicator. And then we'll go back to the opposite jaw. Whether it's the high point or not, you always want to tighten that back down. Okay. Then sometimes I'll just go by and make sure all my jaws are tight again. This is a lot quicker when I'm not uh, on camera here. In fact, I use the forejaw for most of my work. So there's our low point again. Okay, now I'm just gonna go ahead and Put this on zero so we can at least start watching. So that's sixth hour of run out. Make sure that's, yep. So we got six, sixth hour at the high spot. So now we're gonna just tighten on our high spot. Zero, negative two plus one. So we'll go to plus one here and we'll... Now we're running out just about a thou. Now actually, let me take a step back here. We don't really care how much this run out is within reason. And in fact, this is just cold rolled anyways. Uh, so we don't know exactly how true it is. But what we want to do is try to get the run out down to as little as we can so that we can see, just for curiosity's sake, what uh, the uh, top piece's run out is with the dowel pins and the socket head cap screws. What the next step is going to be, in, and it's the reason we have a longer piece here for our bottom half, we're going to turn one true outside OD so that we know those are concentric. And then we're going to drill and bore one ID all the way through. That way we've got two reference geometries that we know are good. So let me finish uh, dialing this outside piece in here and then we'll see what our run out is. I just remembered I've got a tenths dial indicator. So let's throw that on there. It should be a lot more sensitive and we'll see what the run out really is. It gets a little hard to measure one thou. Uh, run out or inside of one thou when you only got one thou lines. Let's zoom in here on the indicator so you can see it a little better. So it looks like we've got about half a thou run out. The uh, one we're on zero and the one being one full thou. So let's see here. Let's figure out, make sure we get which way is up. So if we're on zero and we push up, Oops. yep, so one is our high spot. Oh. 
man, we went went too much. So let's go to our lowest spot here and loosen a little. I don't have any more oomph to tighten. Just barely. We'll try to adjust this back to zero. This is all really just for fun, by the way. Okay. That's as good as I'm going to get it. To be honest with you, I'm not sure does, you know, this can has the resolution of three ten thousandths, which is what we're running out about. Is that accurate? I don't know. But let's do the big test now. Let's go a little bit to the right and see what we got. Wow. You saw I just crossed over the line there. No movement. That's awesome. Well, we'll go all the way out here to make it as extreme as we can. <laughs> How about that? Looks like about, you know, you know, seven tenths of a thou run out, and we were at three tenths before. Um, hard to argue about that. So that's pretty cool. Okay, that's it for part four. Again, if you uh, are into Facebook, you want to see some updates, like the page. I'm thinking I might do a big machine giveaway as an incentive to help grow that audience. So uh, if you're interested in a potential free machine, head on over there. Uh, otherwise, stay tuned, folks. In part five, we'll start making chips again. Thanks.